uh, and a long term action plan for Ukraine, not just press releases. And that's important because it will help reassure Ukraine that we're there for the long term. It will help gear up our British industry to produce the replacement weapons we need for our own British forces and to continue supplying Ukraine. It will help it'll help encourage our allies to do more. And most important, I think, it will make clear that things will get worse, not better for Russia. How significant is it that the Ukrainian president is heading out of Ukraine for the first time since the war began? It's big, isn't it? it this is day 301 of the Russian invasion. Um, Ukraine is winning. Um, Western military assistance is working. But as a Ukrainian MP said to me last month, um, Weapons are the best humanitarian aid. And so the US has been utterly pivotal and the uh, primary supplier of military aid and economic aid to Ukraine. So this meeting is important uh, because Ukraine needs extra help to keep fighting through the winter. It needs to prepare for what we hear are reports of a Russian plan for a big early spring offensive. Um, and it's important that we do all we can in the West to stand by Ukraine, help them confront this Russian aggression and ensure that they win through uh, and win in the end. As you say, John, we're on day 301 of this war. I know that um, yesterday uh, in the Commons, you asked Ben Wallace, the UK Defence Secretary, um, about a schedule for the aid and the materiel that Britain is going to provide to Ukraine in 2023. That hasn't materialised yet. Uh, t tell us about that request and what Wallace has said to you in response. Mm. Well, first of all, in many ways, Ukraine is fighting for the same things that we believe in democracy, the freedom of a people to choose their government and for a country to determine its own future in the world. Uh, and so that's why uh, the government has had for its military assistance to Ukraine and its reinforcement of NATO allies, our fullest labour from support. That's been true from the start. It will continue for the long term. But what we've seen is multiple announcements of weapons from Britain to Ukraine as news headlines for multiple ministerial visits. And we need uh, an, a long term action plan for Ukraine, not just press releases. And that's important because it will help reassure Ukraine that we're there for the long term. It will help gear up our British industry to produce the replacement weapons we need for our own British forces and to continue supplying Ukraine. It will help. It'll help encourage our allies to do more. And most important, I think, it will make clear that things will get worse, not better for Russia. And, and so what has the government said about producing such an action plan? Well, the Defence Secretary said four months ago in August that this was their intention. He said yesterday in the Commons Chamber, when I challenged him, he was disappointed he and his department hadn't been able to do it by now. Uh, and he promised early in the new year that they'd fix that. So uh, I think we need to look forward to and keep the pressure up because Ukraine needs that long term commitment and plan promised by the government on military, economic and humanitarian assistance. And as they face the bleakest of winter and almost a, a, a year of uh, fighting, it, anything that helps reinforce their resolve and their morale uh, is important to do. And their determination to defeat the Russian invasion has been magnificent. And the heroism of the military and civilians alike to resist this Russian aggression has been remarkable. And the fact that they've taken back now more than half the territory that the Russians took after their invasion on the 24th of February is an astonishing achievement and one that we must applaud, but we must do more in 2023 to support their efforts to win this war. Now, in the past uh, week, week or so, there have been reports that Rishi Sunak has uh, um, requested 
a Goldman Sachs style audit of all the support that the UK is giving to Ukraine. That's led to some jitters in Westminster that he may be looking to wind down um, the support that Britain is giving in some way or, or scale it back if he feels it's not achieving value for money or be, being used in a way that, that you know, he or the UK government uh, approves of. He spoke about that yesterday um, at the Liaison Committee in Parliament, insisting that, you know, he was four square behind uh, efforts to support Ukraine. Are you concerned, though, and are you picking up any concerns from your contacts in Ukraine about Sunak now being in charge and his commitment to Kyiv? Uh, the Ukrainians are always looking for uh, reassurance and hard evidence through actions, not just words, of the support that we declare uh, in Britain and um, across other allies for their fight. Uh, we'll do the same. We'll judge the government on their actions and not on their words. They've had our full support for the military assistance that uh, Britain has given to Ukraine uh, to date. Not just the weapons we've helped deliver into Ukraine, but the training that we've undertaken and led in Britain of Ukrainian troops as they're recruited. It's been essential. Um, it's been described as a data-driven assessment and review of the spending on Ukraine. Um, uh, he's got an accountant's turn of mind. Um, I hope he sees the bigger picture. This has got to be democracy-driven, not data-driven. It's got to be um, a commitment to Brit from Britain on, on behalf of the country for the long term. Um, and when we get to defence spending, the bigger concerns aren't just about our commitment to do what's required to confront Russia and stand by Ukraine, but are we doing enough now to deal with the increasing threats that Britain faces? Um, and can we halt the further cuts, deep cuts planned for army numbers? Can we get back on track the obligations that we are beginning to fall short of? in meeting our NATO responsibilities in full. We'll come on to uh, the UK's defence budget shortly, but just um, on Ukraine still, uh, what more do you think Britain should be providing to Ukraine? There's talk now of the, you know, I think we're probably, uh, probably about to hear an announcement about the US offering Patriot um, to Ukraine. There's been some discussion about the appropriateness of not of the UK giving storm shadow missiles. Um, should, the, should Britain be thinking about that or anything else that so far we haven't given to them? Yes, we should be thinking about all options, um, uh, including longer range uh, missiles. And the Defence Secretary himself last week said in the Commons when I challenged him, he was open minded about uh, providing uh, longer range missiles. He wouldn't say yesterday whether he'd made up his mind or not. Um, I hope President Zelensky's discussions with President Biden will lead to a further stepping up of the US support for Ukraine, and that will make it easier for uh, other European nations like Britain to do similar. Are there any specific longer range missiles that you'd like to see Britain give to Kyiv? Most important is that we do our best to respond to the requests that we get from Ukraine. Um, I'm not party to those discussions about the the particular kit, the threats they're facing, the offensive plans they may have. Um, those are matters that the Defence Secretary and the MOD must lead. Um, but I want to make sure that they are accounting to Parliament and to the public about A, what we're doing, but B, what they're then doing to make sure that we produce the replacement stocks that allow us to know that our own British forces remain well equipped and allow us to be confident that we can continue the support, the military support, the weapons assistance, as well as the training that Ukraine's going to need through 2023 and perhaps beyond. And, and what about how the risk calculation has changed uh, as this conflict has evolved? Is it legitimate for Ukraine to use Western donated, UK given weapons to hit Russian territory? Well, we want to see them be able to uh, reclaim the territory that is their sovereign Ukraine territory that was invaded by Russia um, in February. Uh, it followed the 
previous annexation of Crimea and parts of the Donbass as well. So it's the ter sovereignty and territorial integrity that Ukraine must fight for. Um, they'll discuss the deployment and some of the tactics with Britain and with those allies that are supporting uh, the Ukrainian fight. But the most important thing is that we allow them the support they need to fight for themselves to reclaim their country. But in doing so, uh, fight for us all that believe in those basic values of democracy, individual freedom, the rights of citizens to be able to elect a government for themselves and for that government to be able to decide that country's future. But can I just push you on the question of whether it's legitimate or whether we should back them using weapons to hit Russian territory? Well, there's been no, no evidence at all um, that, that Ukraine have been using British donated weaponry to try and hit targets in Russia. They've rightly concentrated their fire and their use of our British weaponry to try and repel the Russians from their own Ukrainian lands. Um, and, and so I think that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the tactics they've been using. It's been effective so far, but it's clear they need our reinforcement to be able to continue that offensive to drive the Russians back. Now, I want to put to you, uh, to you a question that I asked um, Ben Wallace as well last week, which is that uh, the total uh, cost of the support that Britain has given to Ukraine so far in terms of aid uh, and military hardware is about £3.8 billion. I've started to pick up from some MPs um, slight anxiety on the doorstep when they're pounding the pavements at the weekend or speaking to constituents in their surgeries that as the cost of living crisis has really begun to bite in the UK and people are struggling to put food on the table or turn their heating on, that people are beginning to question, or some people are beginning to question, why Britain is spending so much abroad uh, instead of focusing on helping people at home. Are you detecting that as, as an MP? And are you concerned about uh, public sentiment turning against uh, Britain's support for Ukraine? I'm not yet picking that up. Um, I'm vigilant and concerned that uh, that tide of British public opinion may turn. Um, I know how um, desperate many people feel about the uh, cost of living crisis, the increased inflation, the unmanageable energy bills. Um, and I think the government has not done enough to explain not just what we're doing to support Ukraine, but why. Um, it's not done enough to explain that Putin isn't just waging a military war in Ukraine. He's declared a hostility to the West in general. He's been attacking us in different ways um, in the West for some time. He has been using energy to try and hold Europe hostage economically. And he believes that he can soften the West's resolve to continue to support Ukraine. He believes he can divide the uh, Western nations that are supporting Ukraine. Um, and in that way, he believes that he'll be able to retain the military gains uh, in Ukraine, which of course have been a brutal illegal invasion, totally contrary to any article of international law, conducted in the way that's been totally contrary to Geneva Conventions and, and littered with increasing evidence of war crimes. Now, the, for me, part of the argument that flows from that um, explanation to people about the why, not just the what, is that if Ukraine is not successful, if Russia is able, as a strong country, to seize parts of Ukraine by force, to bring down the elected government in Ukraine, to return Ukraine to some sort of client status to a greater Russia, then it is clear that, that they will not stop at Ukraine and that aggression that is directed towards the whole Western system and the alliance of democratic uh, market-based NATO member countries will continue. And so the costs to us as a country in the longer run will be much greater than the costs that we're incurring at the moment as part of our support for Ukraine's fight for their freedom. And given it's December uh, and across the board, people are starting to look into their crystal balls about what 2023 holds. 
Where do you think we might be this time next year when it comes to Ukraine? Do you think there's any chance that there might have been some resolution or agreement that could see an end to the fighting? Or are we still in a much earlier stage of this conflict? To me, there's no sign the Kremlin are ready to offer any concessions. For me, the signs contrary to that, that he, Putin is preparing for this as a long war. Um, preparing plans for a fresh mobilization, digging deep defensive lines, stepping up his uh, more hybrid, if you like, uh, pressure on the West, the economic war that he's waging uh, on the West. Uh, and he's banking on British and other uh, countries' solidarity with the Ukraine weakening and turning around and putting pressure on the Ukrainians to sue for some sort of ceasefire and settlement. Now, uh, be, in, be in no doubt any ceasefire at this point uh, risks locking in those territorial gains that Russia has uh, secured so far. It risks allowing them to regroup their forces for a fresh offensive. It allows them to double down on the brutal administration that they're uh, operating in these seized parts of Ukraine. And in the long run, that will be a much bigger threat to uh, countries like ours and the Western countries beyond Ukraine than it will be. So if we look at 2023, at present I see no sign that Putin is serious about trying to find a settlement. And that leaves the Ukrainians little option but to continue their successful so far, but not sufficiently successful military, military campaign. Let's turn to uh, UK domestic policy then. Um, the government have uh, reopened the integrated review. She soon wants to look again, I think chiefly at two key areas, uh, one being uh, defence spending and the other being China. So, so let, let's take each of those in turn. Um, we know at the moment that defence um, spending is due to fall in real terms for each of the next three years. Where does Labour stand on the level of funding that the MOD should get? What, what is your policy on that? Well, first, first of all, on the review of the integrated review or the <laughs> government's uh, global Britain strategy. First of all, this is really welcome. Um, it is, after all, a strategy. It should be kept up to date. And it took them six months to accept the arguments I was making back in March that it required review, particularly in light of the invasion of Ukraine, which it hadn't foreseen. So really serious threat that hadn't been foreseen and required a uh, response. Secondly, I hope we'll come back to uh, the question that there's more in the integrated review that needs revision than questions about defence spending in China. But on defence spending, um, when the first duty of any government is to protect the country, um, uh, a Labour government has in the past and will in the future defend, uh, spend what's necessary to defend the country. And we left government in 2010 with defence spending at 2.5% of GDP. That's a, that's a level that's never been matched at all in the successive 12 years of Tory government since. Um, defence spending has got to match the threats. And so, for instance, after the 9-11 attacks, um, when Labour was in government, we brought in then the biggest sustained increase in defence spending for two decades. So defence spending has got to match the threats. And my immediate concern is that the Defence Department is operating this year and next year as the only department with, the, uh, with a real terms cut in its revenue budget. In other words, the day-to-day -day spending that the MOD has on things like forces recruitment, training, pay, family support, uh, is being cut. And this is a settlement that the Defence Secretary should never have agreed, but did, and is now, now managing budget cuts at a time when threats are increasing. And in, and in fact, you know, our forces are being called on to do more and more on the domestic front to make up for some of the failures of other government departments. So the pressures are acute. The review of defence spending and defence planning is required. After all, 22 NATO nations have already rebooted defence plans and defence spend uh, since the invasion, and we're only now just playing catch-up. The second thing, then, 
I think, is that whatever the political declarations about defence spending that we've heard from Conservative figures, we're facing a real terms cut in the revenue budget. There's been no sign of extra defending, uh, of spending for defence. Uh, it's been kicked back from the autumn statement when the government was prepared to put some more money in to deal with pressures in the NHS and schools. It's been kicked back to the uh, spring budget. But now we learn that the integrated review may not even be published before the 15th of March when the spring budget's uh, uh, due. So, uh, and Ben Wallace himself in the Commons yesterday didn't seem confident that this could be uh, this would be done. So, uh, for me, the government's um, in a something of a uh, incoherent, um, it's incoherent. How how would I say it kindly? Uh, I think the government is inconsistent and incoherent about its strategic direction for Britain in the future, and it is failing to make sure that our um, defence budget is capable of matching both the threats that we face and the ambitions that we may have as a country to play a proper role as a leading NATO ally and as an ally with other really important democracies and countries around the world. Well, you make clear there where you think the government is falling short. But just to return to that question, where does Labour, where do you think defence funding should should lie? What what level should it reach? You know, we've had a big debate this year about whether it should get to 2.5% of GDP by 2026. That was uh, one of the milestones Liz Truss talked about, to 3% by 2030. Is that something you back or, or, or not? Well, look, first of all, let's be clear. Um, we judge them on actions, not words. 3% was, has been nothing more than a pitch by Liz Trust to win the Tory leadership campaign. There's been no boost to defence in that big mini budget when they were ready to splurge 200 billion uh, into public, uh, public spending. There's been no new money for defence in the autumn statement. And as far as 2.5%, which uh, some have said they want to reach by 2026, that was the level that Labour was spending when we uh, lost government in 2010. They've got nowhere near that since. And it's been bumping along close to the 2% uh, NATO uh, baseline. Now, for a Labour government, a Labour commitment, and you've got to remember that Keir Starmer has made the declaration that Labour will never again go into an election not trusted on national security. He and I have both served in government. We both understand the first duty of any government is to defend the country and keep its citizens safe. And we'll do in future in government what we've done in the past in government. We'll spend what's required. Now, what's required uh, depends on the threats that the country faces and the uh, defences we need to protect uh, protect people. We can't know that. One of the um, sort of special asymmetries of government and opposition in the defence field is that quite unlike any other area of health or education or welfare spending, um, we have no access to information that is classified, and in many cases, um, highly classified. Uh, what are the threats we assess from adversaries, uh, not just other states? What are the capabilities that those who might do us harm may have? What are the capabilities of our own ability to defend ourselves? What are the costs, the real costs of, of what's needed and what we've already got? So none of that information is available to us in opposition, which is why I, I've said that we will, uh, on day one, we will launch a Labour uh, Strategic Defence and Security Review. Um, I want this government's update of the integrated review to give us a good basis for that, but we will do our own review and we'll make the consequential um, commitments uh, uh, on defence spending in light of an assessment of those threats and when we get a chance to open up the books. We just can't do that in detail with specific figures this side of an election. Let's talk about China then. Um, Rishi Sunak uh, has been a bit all over the place on what he said about it. One uh, more robust take in the summer when he was trying to win the votes of Tory members. Yesterday when he spoke to the Liaison Committee at pains to stress that China is a systemic challenge rather than a threat. 
how do you view China? How does Labour view China and the way that the British policy should be set against uh, Beijing? I think you've seen from Labour very um, strong challenges to China and to the British government to stand up to China when uh, human rights have been um, threatened, uh, when violence has been perpetrated in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Uh, you've seen uh, in the bigger picture, an increasingly authoritarian China at home and a more assertive China uh, abroad. So uh, the Prime Minister is right, and the integrated review was right 18 months ago when it described China as a systemic competitor to um, Britain and to our allies. So there are important elements that we need to stand up for in ensuring the international rule of law, um, uh, basic human rights are respected. And then there are areas where um, there is cooperation required with China on things like climate change, on global health, uh, and on uh, properly, properly regulated and uh, rules-based trade. So it's a systemic com competitor to um, Britain and to our allies, um, rather than what some might regard, uh, um, like Russia, as a direct threat. Thank you. Let's talk about strikes. We know that soldiers who've been given a, a pay rise of 3.75% uh, this year are being asked to backfill for ambulance workers, for border force staff who are going on strike, rejecting more generous pay offers. Is that fair to our soldiers to do that when they're getting a lower boost this year? Well, for me, uh, first principles, our, our armed forces are there to defend the country. That's their primary job. It's what the chief of the defence staff said at the weekend. Um, we need to focus on our primary job, uh, especially as threats are rising. Um, and especially, to be honest, as we've got government ministers cutting the number of our full-time forces, there's already 40,000 fewer than uh, 2010 and the deep cuts to the army over the next two years to make it much more difficult to deal with domestic demands. However, there is a role. There's always been a role for our armed forces to step in, up and help the country through when there are emergencies, um, wide-scale flooding, the pandemic, uh, and some contingency planning is still really sensible and sound, but uh, I know they'll do a professional job. I just don't want to see them diverted from their primary job of defending the country. And I particularly don't want to see them misused by ministers that should be resolving these disputes, not escalating them. Um, and I don't want to see them being brought in as a backstop, if you like, when basic public services are failing, because that's not their job. Well, you've made clear your view then that this is a misuse of uh, soldiers. I was fascinated, and you just uh, um, re referred to this, that Admiral Sir Tony Radican, the Chief of the Defence Staff, uh, made clear at the weekend um, his concern about uh, perhaps an over-reliance on the military by the government for some of these contingencies. His intervention led to a bit of a backlash. Some people, Jacob Rees-Mogg among them, said it's not appropriate for senior military figures, serving military figures, to get involved in political discourse like this. Isn't, isn't there something to that? No, I think our armed forces would expect their, um, their boss to speak up about their frustrations and concerns. It's, it's not a misuse of our forces to be used as emergency cover when there are real risks, for instance, in driving ambulances, but there's real frustration uh, that they're not trained to do the proper job and the full job. And I think what I want to see is ministers do a great deal more to resolve these disputes instead of winding them up. And I don't want to see our forces used as a way of supporting ministers who aren't doing their proper job, uh, leading leading and sorting out the public services that we all rely on. 
but given they are being brought in to, to do this role um, and you say it is appropriate for them to, to, to uh, backfill for ambulance workers if they're going on strike, shouldn't soldiers be offered a more generous pay rise? Isn't it unfair? We know the law, they're not allowed to strike, unlike ambulance workers, unlike border officials for, who they'll, for whom they'll be filling in. Well, I, I've, I've heard that case. Um, our forces know the terms they serve on. They serve with absolute professionalism. And if they're called in uh, over the Christmas period, they will do that job. I think the best thing that government could do to reward the forces would be to resolve the dispute, stand the forces down and let them spend Christmas and New Year with their families. And just finally, uh, John Healy, I know that Labour this week uh, put forward an urgent question on the state of service accommodation, which is another cause for concern in the military. Um, tell us what's, uh, what's got the party up in arms about service accommodation. What, what's upset and angered me is the contacts that I've been having from service um, personnel and their families. I've been seeing pictures of uh, deep mould, uh, holes in outside walls, kids having to sleep in uh, homes with no heating. And when you consider that we've got nearly 50,000 forces family homes, a third of them are waiting for repairs. In the last five months alone, there were 5,000 complaints about the condition of these homes and the failure to get these uh, re basic repairs done. It seems to me that this is, in, in many ways, we're failing our forces and their families. This should be the least they can expect as part of the contract that we as a nation have with them when they're prepared to join up, put on the uniform, and in some cases put their lives at risk to defend us. And we can't provide the basic decent homes for them and their families to live in. This is a national disgrace. And we challenged ministers in the Commons Labour yesterday. Um, they've got to get tougher on the contractors. They've got to review the terms on which that they hold and that they uh, offer this housing. And they've got to do a great deal better in 2023. Well, a huge thanks to you, uh, John Healy, Labour Shadow Defence Secretary, for joining Times Radio's Ukraine series and answering a few extra questions about other defence policies today. Uh, that's all we've got time for. A big thanks also to Louis Sykes, our producer.